Good afternoon, everybody. Richard just came up and I asked him any, any, anything I need to know. Yeah, start on time and end on time. Okay, he's cracking the whip. So I'm gonna definitely do that. It's 1240, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. And we're going to, um, we're gonna, we're kind of sort of mix up the topics here a little bit. We've been talking a lot about cost estimating, cost analysis, and all those kinds of things. So we're gonna talk about a subject that's actually near and dear to Jeff Civic's heart. Because <laughs> uh, he helped, uh, he helped craft this while actually he was uh, at at, Nash, at at NSF as part of LFO, and so um, if you have any complaints, don't talk to me. You can talk to Jeff. No, seriously, this was actually a very important subject, and um, uh, and so it's I'm going to talk about a different section of the the research infrastructure guide, which is about project personnel and competencies. This is Rig Section 4.6.6. It's not really new or. Or it's not terribly new. We've, we've talked about this at, you know, we've been talking about this for a little bit. I really wanted to have the conversation so that folks could understand, so I could get some feedback from all of you on how this is working and, and how, it, you know, and how it's working and, and how you're implementing it in your pro proposal submissions. Um, and uh, so we can have a dialogue on it. I don't have a huge number of slides, lots of time for Q&A. So I'm really looking for some feedback at the end, as you'll see from all of you on, like we've talked about a lot, how should this? How could this be made clearer and better in the next revision of the research infrastructure guide? Right, right. And so, and, and that that I, to understand that, I need to know how you're we need to know how you're implementing it and what's clear and what's not cl not clear. So anyway, this is about section four point six. It's about person project personnel competencies, and it it stems from this GAO recommendation from twenty nineteen. And I pulled it right out of the GAO report. You can go look at it yourself. This is one that we've gotten credit for, for full implementation. Remember way back at the beginning, I said no new recommendations in the latest GAO report. We only have one left, and that's related to NSF staff, right? Implementation of PMIA, which I'll talk about in just a second here. This is about all of you and all of your staff. And basically, the recommendation says, establish criteria for project management expertise. Uh, and then um, incorporate the criteria for project requirements and external panel reviews, right? So I highlighted a few key words there. This recommendation really focused on project management, right? NSF made this broader. We recognize that to manage a major facility, there's a much broader suite of competencies that your staff need to manage that effectively. And it's not just project management. So we took this recommendation, expanded it to something we've been talking about for years. We've always reviewed in the, during the review process your project teams, right? Now we've got some, some sort of some, some criteria and some bounds around it. So we took this a little further, right? Than, than GAO you know, originally recommended. Um, and this is part of the external panel review process now, whether it's construction or operations. Okay, I just want flex, folks to know that. And how we implemented the project requirement, right? So incorporate the criteria into project requirements is this term and condition in your, in your cooperative agreements. This is just major facilities now, right? So if you're mid-scale, you probably don't see Article 78. It's a very soft requirement intentionally, right? It's a pointer to the rig. Hey, this is what we expect, right? It's really all it says. And at the time, we didn't know it was section 4.6.6. We just we knew, it would be, we knew it would be under section 4.6. And so that's all it is. It's a pointer. This is our expectation of how you're going to do your team. Because if you go to the rig, there's a lot, again, a lot of flexibility, depending on the, the, the life cycle stage and the nature of your project. And so we didn't want to make it hard and fast. Thou shalt have these competencies, right? We didn't want to make it thou shalt have because project teams are in flux, right? They're in flux, and if there's any one point in time where you don't have someone that's filling a certain competency for whatever reason, we didn't want you to not be in compliance with your terms and conditions, right? People are fluid, right? People are fluid, and it's not like you know a technical requirement for a telescope, right? Teams are fluid, and so we wanted to make sure that there wasn't an opportunity we wanted where you'd be out of compliance with the terms and conditions, and but tell you what our expectations were. That's why this term is written that way. Okay, so what? So here, here's here's the summary. This is the summary of uh, of Rig Section four point six point six. It's ex exactly like how we do it at NSF for the for the NSF integrated project team, right? We take a team approach to meeting the competencies there. Uh, this is how we've implemented PMIA, the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act. There was a poster uh, yesterday in the other room on this. 
And it's very much the team approach, right? Unlike other federal agencies that expect the project manager to hold all the competencies, right? We don't expect the program officer, the LFO liaison, or the grants and agreements officer at NSF to hold all the competencies, right? It's a team, it, it, together at an aggregate as a team, they meet all the, the competencies. Uh, and that's a subtle difference between um, NSF and, and other agencies that have federal product, project managers that manage the project themselves. You guys manage the project, we do oversight. So we took the same approach with all of you, right? We don't expect you, all the competence, competencies to, to be held by one single individual. Okay, so that's something you'll certainly see. Uh, we wanna make sure we covered all life cycle stages, right? Not just construction, focus on project management. We wanna make sure we covered all life cycle stages. And we broke it into two parts. Uh, and we put some definitions around the three key personnel that NSF has approval authority over, right? Principal investigator, the project director, which may be the PI, may be the co-PI, right? You know, there's some flexibility when you read the text on how that could actually be done. Again, we didn't want to be overly prescriptive. And also the project manager or operations manager for O&M. So those are the key personnel, the minimum key personnel. Doesn't mean we couldn't name somebody else, right? Those are the minimum key personnel. And then there's everybody else, the project team. Okay, and, and I took a little quote from the bottom there that basically is what I said, is that uh, I did, project team is the additional staff who collectively with the key personnel possess the competencies uh, detailed in uh, that particular section, which is the table. And it can be any combination of individuals or organizational units, such as your sponsored research office, right? So lots of flexibility on, on how you guys implement this. What, you want, what we want you to do is think about it and put it in your proposal so we understand who's doing what. It's really what it boils down to. It's pretty straightforward. So we approach this, again, I've talked about the Program Management Improvement and Accountability Act a number of times. This is right in the rig too. I, I took it, this is right from OMB's memorandum on implementation of PMIA, which is 100% for federal staff, right? So these principles, Right? These aren't actually competencies. These are the framework of principles that you should build your competency model around. All right? These are the principles that we want everyone to meet. So we, we, we said, why wouldn't we use the same model, right? the same set of principles? Right? We're not going to reinvent the, the wheel. And so, so look, these should all look very familiar, right? Portfolio, you know, performance management, uh, financial management, human capital management, all the things we expect you to do, risk management, project management, all should look very, very, very familiar. Okay, so that's where it comes from. That's the basics. And so this table may, this table may look uh, complicated, but then what we did is take those principles and break them down into competencies in general, right? from project management, program management, EVM, risk, you can read down through here, information technology, workforce management, and then by life cycle stage. And notice there's very, very few where we say you have to have it. And hopefully it intuitively makes sense. Construction, right? Uh, again, major facilities, right? Construction, gotta have competence. Someone has to have competencies in, uh, in earned value management. We require EVM, right? Someone has to have competencies in uh, project management, and that should be one of the key personnel, right? Probably the project manager, most likely, and others of the team. Um, and notice on some of these things, EVM, it could be the key personnel, it could be the project manager, or someone else in the project team, a hired gun, a consultant. They're on your project team, right? They could hold those competencies. And so we did the same thing for everything, and, and notice how very little requirements for development, very little requirements for divestment now, now going to, to disposition. Really the big ones are design, construction, and operations, as you'd expect. And they differ slightly as you look down through them. Um, and, uh, and, but there's a lot of similarities between construction and operations, a lot of requirements there, right? Those are the two biggies, that's where the big numbers are. Um, and so that is basically the, uh, the, the framework with which we've laid out and so, um, these are minimum requirements. And so you can tailor these to the nature of your, 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 your project or your, or your facility operation or wherever you happen to be in the life cycle stage. Okay, and so what I did here is all I did, if you read down further in this section, we actually defined this, right? We didn't leave it for you all to sort of figure out. We threw in what our best guess at the time was, right? And I picked, 
I picked a couple of these data management information technology workforce development because these are big right now, right? And from, you know, uh, you know, cybersecurity, cyber infrastructure. Remember I talked about that at the very beginning, that this is going to be some text we're going to be adding to the research infrastructure guide. So I just wanted to sort of uh, throw some examples of how we've defined these things. Um, and um, this is where we're looking for feedback. Does this all, did this work for you when you submitted your last proposal? For example, OOI just put theirs in. Noir Lab has submitted a proposal. Um, uh, you know, that number of proposals are going in and, and things are being reviewed, uh, including design and construction, right? Leadership class computing facilities moving through the queue, right? Uh, and so um, I'm really curious, again, what your questions might be, having had it in the rig for a little bit and trying to figure out how to implement it. And how's it working in the proposal and review process? Right? How are you seeing it playing out and how can we make, is it, is, it, is it helping you? We had to do it because of the GAO requirements, right? We had to put some bounds around it because it was very nebulous before. So is it working for you? Where do you need clarity, right? Those kinds of things. So literally, that's all I had for the slide deck. I wanted to sort of frame it, make sure everyone understood what we're talking about, the flexibilities granted and the principles we used. And I'm just going to kick it all over to you for whatever thoughts you might have and what we can hear from you as far as uh, how we can make it better or clearer or, uh, and all the things we are normally looking for. So with that, I will toss it out for questions. Oh, ready. Are you ready to raise your hand? <laughs> Since there's been a lot of discussion about mid-scale, so if you have your, your table where, you know, mm -hmm. um, of the people that you, yeah, this table. Uh -huh. So, you know, there must be a threshold somewhere in the mid-scale where some of these things apply or not apply, you know. If you say earned value, right? I mean, there are mid-scales that are low enough that probably you don't want to do earned value. But if you're at 50 million, you probably do. Yeah, we're, that's a really, really, uh, really good question. We don't have any specified thresholds. This drives some people crazy, right? DOE actually says anything over 40 million or 50 million, you got to use earned value. We don't do it that way. It depends on the technical nature of the project. Some things would benefit from earned value at 20 million. Others at 60 million might be just a big acquisition. Why would you use earned value, right? So again, we, we don't, number thresholds for us are, problematic or could be for all of you and we don't want to impose that randomly but the, you ask a great question because technically this only applies for major facilities we don't refer to this section right from section five of the rig so, right however if you've got a, a, a mid-scale project that's looking like a major facility maybe you should look at this, <laughs> right? It's like a lot of the principles we have in the guide, right? Those things, we, we, we put section five with the research infrastructure guide so that it's, you can link it and look at it in the context of everything we consider for major facilities. But if you're doing a mid-scale project, you start with section five and the minimum requirements are there. Everything else is up to you, right? And so if you're doing a mid-scale project, look at this as guidance and to ask yourself, do I have the right competencies, right? Project management, gosh, I'm doing a 60 million, pretty complicated mid-scale project. Did I hire a project manager? I sure hope so. <laughs> I sure hope so. What other of these competencies do I need to have, right? Or should I be thinking about, right? We're never gonna hold you to this, but it's here so that you can use it as a reference, right? Like a lot of sections in the rig. I'm Damian Bailey with Oregon State. Well, it was interesting you just said, I'm never gonna hold it, hold this, hold you to this, right. um, as that was my next question. So the uh, next table on the, the, the next slide here, um, as part of our um, PEP, our HR plan, we have, we include our team bios, is, or CVs. Is the expectation that those CVs for those positions should map to these competencies? Yeah, great. Thank you, Damien. That's actually a really good question. I'm going to go back to my original one of my slides here. We have no approval authority over your team. We will not ask for their CVs, right? Right. We're going to ask you in your proposal to articulate 
how you're meeting it. And you can just say, my person meets these competencies, right? We don't have privity into that. The only people we can actually look at, say, please send me your resume and we'll scrutinize the heck out of you is key personnel, right? It's, all we want to do is articulate it. Why don't you tell us how you're doing it so that we can then say, yeah, they got their act together. Mm, you're missing some folks here. You ought to think about how this is, you know, we, the panel, we can ask the panel, because we're going to ask the panel, how is the proposal, how is the proposed project team meeting the requirements of section 4.6 of the research infrastructure guide? It's a real easy question, right? One question. And they look at it and they go, yeah, they got their act together, or no, kind of, they're kind of missing some stuff here, right? And that becomes recommendations to the foundation. It's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. Your project team is up to you. Just, just, just describe it. Uh, if if we could scroll back to the table you had for uh, uh, your comments. Uh, uh, within risk management, I noticed that you had it optionable for uh, uh, the design uh, yeah. period. Wouldn't, um, I mean... I kind of feel that uh, having key personnel in that position during the design phase could potentially mitigate any type of retrofits later down the road if, uh, you know, a, a risk was, uh, you know, came into focus and, and it's usually the cheaper time to uh, correct. That is a great observation. In fact, I'm going to mark it on my screen right now and make that required. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, it, it is. These are the things that this is what we're looking for. Right, we, we likely went back and forth on that. I don't know if you remember, remember Jeff. I, we may have gone back and forth on that particular question. When do you really absolutely need to have it by? Remember, it's optional, right? If it's the design state, right, and so you, you're, 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 you bring up, a, it, that could become something that you all say, you know, NSF, you should kind of make that required, right? Right, that's what we see. And then we'll take that revised and we'll, we'll change it, right? Because likely we were on the fence about it. Right. Yeah. Right. Part of the argument too, though, is that, or part of the, probably our logic was um, under the project management. Right. So what we're saying here is that one of your key personnel or um, project team needs to be, uh, uh, you know, it, it's optional because maybe the minimum is met by your the pro, under the project management competency, right? There's a little bit of overlap here, right? So I think there might have been a trend to strengthen it as the projects went through, and perhaps for, again, based on the technical nature of the project, I'll ask Damien. I'm going to pick on Damien because I love picking on Damien because he's here. When you were in the design for the RCRV, right, did you have someone specifically with, uh, um, uh, with risk management capabilities that wasn't the project manager yes you did great yes great. we had a well we were fortunate at osu we had a, a professor who was a risk manager for construction engineering and he basically donated his time to the project it was very helpful yeah fantastic so this is exactly the kind of observation we're looking for and if you're all on board that we should make some of these things either more stringent or less stringent that's what we want to hear Hurricane Ida uh, sweep within 10 miles of our end station uh, and right. caused a lot of damage. But between that, uh, you know, the, the flood in 2016, uh, there's a lot of things uh, that potentially, you know, if you went back to conceptual design, things might have been done a little bit different uh, uh, if risk management possibly was involved in that a little, a little more deeper. So, Right. Yeah, because you're, you're hitting a great point. You know, th those facilities are in operations. Look that we do have it required for risk management for operations. It's go it goes to everything we were talking about earlier about uh, resilience to climate change, right? Facility condition assessments. That's risk assessment. That's what Ann, you know, Ann uh, from GSA was saying. This is just a risk assessment exercise, right? It's really awesome. And that's, you can see clearly, that's absolutely why we've required it for, for operations. Hey, Matt. Uh, yeah. Craig Jackson from Trusted CI. We're uh, an NSF-funded cybersecurity resource for this community. Um, you had the the cybersecurity competency was was on. Yeah, 
is was under uh, IT there. Uh, and I know that's a pretty new one to have in the rig, maybe just this last version. Mm -hmm. With proposals coming in, I mean, are you getting feedback on that? Are you seeing that competency explicitly addressed or, or any challenges, you know, in, in, in this particular area? Yeah, I, I haven't heard anything, right? You know, we, um, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm waiting for some outputs of some of these reviews to ask that question. Right. And looking at these panel reviews and, and, the, and the, their responses to this particular this, you know, to this particular question. So I don't have any real hard data. I'm you know, for those of you that may have been through the process and it may be too early. Right. Because this is this this might be a little too early to be embedded fully in our thinking internally with the review and the rig. You know, the rig is relatively new. So we may not have a lot of good data yet. It's one reason why I'm bringing it up now. Right. To remind everybody that it's here. And that we're going to be looking at it more thoroughly. And as you're saying, Craig, it's likely something we're going to be, we even may add, ask more specific questions around given the technical nature of the, you know, the, you know, of, of the project itself. How much cyber infrastructure and cyber, uh, how much cyber infrastructure does it have, right? It might be minimal for a particular facility. Not, not many of them are minimal, right? I know you're shaking your head. Um, so, right. So we will we'll need to calibrate that based on what folks put forward. Just, just a quick observation, you know, at, with Trusted CI, we are not just focused on technology. So, so personnel, I mean, we, we're currently helping one major facility write a job description for a new cybersecurity job. So we want to be a resource for you all if you're, if you're running up against this. Okay. Yeah, good point. Good point, Craig. And notice this is one reason why I wanted to bring this up, because um, if you go back to the, to the table, um, again, this is, Cybersecurity, cyber infrastructure, or that particular one, information technology, it could be that it is, you know, maybe someone really high up, you have a, you have a person who's key personnel that is really, really on top of this, and he's supported by the project team. It could be, I'm guessing, uh, again, Damien or some of the other facilities, you rely on your institution for cyber infrastructure, cyber security, and, 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 and maybe some of the folks on the ship. Right, you know, and so again, you got again. We got to give you the flexibility to be able to de describe that for the way that works for your particular facility. But again, just no, just know we're going to be paying attention to that and looking and looking at that particular competency. Where does it lie? Uh, Jeff Zivik, uh, University of Chicago. Um, I guess if I was if I was sitting next to you now, uh, I would be pushing harder to make uh, risk management and earn value management. Uh, as required during design because it's in that stage that you're developing one if you're if you're proposing contingency you should have somebody that has risk management experience and if you're proposing earn value you have to design that earn value system in during design so so I I, I would vote for including those okay very good go ahead rich my name's Rich from the RCRV project at Oregon State, and I totally agree with Jeff. It's nice to say that. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, For uh, once. <laughs> <laughs> we go way back, 2004. Um, the, uh, but I just w wanted to point out to all of us, and, uh, and thank you for this table, because, I mean, this table empowers, like, the project manager or the PI to get support and shows their institution what they exactly. need and when they need it. Exactly. And, um, and so it's to our, all our benefit that it's right and it's all encompassing and, um, and maybe information technology and cybersecurity are two different things. Um, you know, things like that are, uh, yeah, it should be, it's definitely should be a work in progress. Right. It's why, it's why I really wanted to have the discussion, right? It's still early on. But I don't want to get too far, along, uh, far far down the path before we have the discussion with all of you. Because, Rich, you said it exactly right. This is your leverage. This is your leverage to say, I'm doing a major facility. Yeah, I'm in the design stage. But this is what you've got to support me with. And this is what got to be in our proposal. Right? It's, it's, it, is, it is the leverage. Hi, Sam Steinman from NPR. I'm just kind of reflecting on my experience with the Department of Energy project lifecycle and thinking of other roles. Uh, the, the responsibility for 
technology maturity, technology readiness to move advanced through the stages. Mm -hmm. And that there's some specific requirements in the DOE orders. Is yeah. that like a principal investigator responsibility? Or is that like outside of project management and kind of covered by a different part of the rig? Uh, yeah, you know, we don't have a lot of, if you look at the stage gate reviews, we we don't really, we don't use the technical readiness levels, for example, that NASA does, right? We don't have those sorts of things. We ask a critical question that PDR, it's pretty, it's pretty general. Uh, you know, are, can you, can you develop a bottom-up cost estimate? And I think it is as FDR, I have my rig right in front of me, I should look this up. Are the technologies industrial, able to be industrialized, i.e. move to production, right? We have, we, we have pretty high level requirements around that um, or guidance around that. And we don't really call that out here, right? I don't think we get into that when you look at the table in the rig. Again, it's a great observation. Maybe we do. Maybe there needs to be somebody that is assessing the, the, the technical readiness inside the project so that it can be presented appropriately at a stage gate review. I don't know. Think about that. Take, take a look at that. Um, we, have a pretty, you've, we have a pretty light touch on that, and we let the proposing organizations demonstrate their ability to move through the stage gates. Any more questions? Any other questions, comments? Arturo Garcia, I'm from the IRC Observatory. I would like to just comment maybe along the same lines as the other folks, uh, you know, right now the facility obviously is in an operations stage, hmm? but we have a couple of projects inside the facility which maybe don't fit in, in into the operations life cycle station. Maybe another way to look at it would be uh, not, not in terms of the facility per se, as, but more into what type of project we're working on specifically at the time. Uh, in our case, obviously, we had the impact of the Hurricane Maria in 2017, yep. and we have an award. Uh, we're restoring a lot of the capabilities of the, of the site. So that definitely would... I think would fit in nicely in the construction life cycle stage requirements. Yeah. But mm -hmm. we're in operations, so. Right. This and, is a uh, the, the thing with the, with the institution and with you guys and with us guys at the facility, that exchange of, you know, requirements and communication, you know, it could probably help us be in a better position to succeed. Very much so. And again, I, we, we have to be a little careful on operations because, for example, ships, ships are in operations, right? You know, there's, we have lots of different kinds of facilities operations. That's the project management one is optional under operations. But anyone from NCAR here? NCAR and the, the uh, no, one, no one from NCAR? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to make a bold guess that when they built the, um, the research aviation facility, they had a project manager for that, <laughs> right? It's a construction project under an O&M award. There's no doubt that they did, and there's no doubt that Noir Lab has project managers uh, in, right? And so it's optional. We just, we, we always, and this is the other thing to always keep in mind, right? We've got to, un, we gotta always think about the full breadth of facilities that we fund, right? All the way from the academic fleet to the Rubin Observatory. And so if we put it as required, I'm now making Damian Bailey have a project manager on his O&M team. So we got we to gotta, we gotta think, and this is the, always the challenge with NSF, and, uh, is, is, is we got to think about the, our, the very broad portfolio that we fund and call major facilities. Right. That we could... Um mutually help ourselves is in, in the description of each one of those competencies where you could call out some of those uh, um, aspects of, 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 you know, project management might actually be uh, appropriate in an O&M phase, for example, and working with one's project uh, or program officer could help establish whether that was needed, and then that would give you a direct... Yep. Uh, channel to support the need of the facility. 
Yeah, those conversations with the program, look, you're funding me to do this work under my O&M award. We need, I note that under construction, this is required. This is a construction activity, right? Would you support the funding of a project manager to do this, right? My guess is, Chris, what would... <laughs> Yeah, right. Yes, please hire someone and put it in your proposal. We'll consider it. Right? These are these. Right, right, exactly. Right, put it in a proposal as part of that activity and we'll consider it. I never want to commit program, right? I notice I always say, put it in your proposal and we'll consider it. LFO doesn't have the money, right? This is guidance for you to use with your institutions and your organizations and your program to get what you need to make the project successful, right? This was just the dialogue I was hoping for. Fantastic, right? So I don't want to drag it. Rob, go ahead. I don't want to drag it out any longer. This is uh, what I was exactly what I was. You just sp sparked something in my head. How, what's your view? And you know, um, maybe this is putting you on the spot a little bit. But what's your view through the, throughout the foundation and the directorates about how um, connected to the rig and things like this table are the program officers throughout NSF? How much do, are they embracing it? How much are they either yeah. ignoring it or not accepting it or pushing back on it? Right. It's just like any group of people or any organization. Some embrace it and understand it like down to the letter. Oh, yeah, Chris, thanks. Others are new, right? And they're still, they're still looking at it. And I always tell people, it's a pointer for you. Use it to your advantage to have a conversation around, right? That's really important. It varies like any organization. So you just use these tools to your to your advantage. And I'll just uh, riff on that and include something that Matt and I were talking about. You know, this is a forum for uh, discussions with our awardees. Um, but this is an evolution, a continuing evolution for people inside the building as well. So, um, you know, if you went to your program officer tomorrow and said, what about the third row, fourth column on this? You know, what does this mean to me? Your program officer might say, uh, I'll have to get back to you because we, we, we are also having these conversations internally. And so um, we need to actually bring them on board. So that's, that's an ongoing effort. Anyone else? Damien? Well, this is just kind of a follow-up from previous large facility workshops. You had a session on certifications a couple years ago. I'm, I'm not seeing any certifications in any of your competencies. It looks like the competencies come from the certifications. So just to be clear, there's no required certifications at the project level, but the, cert the competencies that might be associated with those certifications are. Yeah, this is a great internal dialogue I've had with Patrick Green many times about federal staff, right, and requirement of certifications. It's really a certification may be ev evidence of the competency that you have. So could 40 years of experience, right? We want to be very careful with all of you. I always, I always, I, Damien will probably appreciate this one too. I've worked with lots of cap, I've worked with captains over the years that, you know, used to drive super tankers, right? Right? They couldn't dock a 40 foot boat. Right, but they have a Coast Guard license that says they can, you know, drive a super tanker. Two very different skill sets, right? Actually, being able to dock a boat because the pilot always does that, right? Or the chief or the first mate always does that, or whatever, right? So a piece of paper is not an evidence of competency. It could help justify that you you have that competency, but it's a combination of certifications, training, experience, certifications, sometimes depending on the competency. And we want all you guys to do that. The people are your people, not ours. That's why there is no, we don't have certification requirements. There's some people that would have, probably would have liked to, to us to have done that, but we did not do that. More questions? Okay. Good question so far. That's great. Nobody else? Wonderful. I'll give you back some extra time. Please, uh, again, there's the, there's the Hoover, the, there's the Hoover app. Uh, emails are, are, are always welcome. Um, and, uh, and, and we've taken some, uh, obviously some notes on these, uh, these, uh, um, these recommendations and we'll look forward to hearing more from you on it.
Much appreciated. Thank you.